54. We should have been with Cotto, but we could have got that fight when Cotto was retiring. And I turned it down because Puerto Rico was in darkness. So I should have did it. Danny would have been the been champion. And then we could have fought um, Peterson. At, at, we fought him at a catchweight. We could have been the IBF champion, too. He could have been unified. IBF, WBC, WBA, Ring Magazine champion of the world. You know what I'm saying? So we're looking forward now. We, we passed all that. Now we're looking at a new era in Danny's life, a new chapter. It's at 154, we fight. Whoever won it, they can get it. Like, like Broner said, Mexicans can get it. Africans can get it. Puerto Ricans can get it. Anybody can get it. <laughs> uh, what's going on? We got a lot to talk about in this uh, hour show. We're going to be here for the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Uh, going over several topics. Um, I, get, I didn't get a chance to do a uh, post-fight stream on um, Garcia versus Jose Benavidez. We did do a live fight commentary stream. We streamed during the uh, main event, but Showtime took the video down. Um, it happens. It happened to that video, my Mark Maxeo video. To be honest, it's one of those type of... Um, uh, briefly, I'll explain. Whenever you see my videos get taken down, it's because basically they let me do it. I'm grateful that they let me use, you know, their highlights, but it's a give and take type of thing to where it's like, all right, cool. You know, you'll let me do it. You'll let me keep my post fight video. But since I show highlights in between rounds, they can't really keep it up. It depends. They can, I can keep it up, but it's, it's, it's a long story. It's a business YouTube thing, copyright, you know, just know that everything's cool. But anyway, um, normally after big fights, uh, with big name fighters, I would, I don't really consider this a big fight. I didn't consider it a big fight. I normally do a, uh, post fight video, like a post fight stream where I would stream the post fight press conference and give my thoughts. So it's no secret that if you've seen my post fight video, I was a little untethered because frankly, I was pissed off at Jose Benavidez for the performance he put up. But then again, uh, respectfully, my man is kind of di disabled and handicapped. Now, I understand how the Puerto Ricans can feel. Now, T Street, I'm going to let you know right now. I'm about I'm about a hair away from identifying as Puerto Rican. And we can do that. It's 2022. So if you Puerto Ricans better get off my back or before you know it, I'm going to be one of you. So basically what I'm saying is I had a lot of Puerto Ricans uh, in my comments, you know, talking all this shit. How come you can't give Danny Garcia his credit? He shined. He looked good. But at the same time, I covered boxing. You dig? Danny did look good. He looked great. Like, he looked phenomenal. In fact, I can't really think about a time where I ever seen Danny look that good of a boxer. I'm talking about not a pressure fighter, power puncher, a boxer. But at the end of the day, Jose Benavidez had one motherfucking leg. He, have, he has like a plate in his knee from when he got shot. And even in the predictions, I'm not the only one that was saying this shit. Is that his body would be so easy to hit. Danny was hitting him with everything to the body. He couldn't miss. It was 150 plus uh, body punches that landed. From my understanding from the punch stats. Let me see if I can I should have pulled that up before. But he couldn't miss. Because Jose Benavidez can't move. He got one leg. But my issue is this. It looked like he was kind of scared to engage meaning Jose Benavidez because he wasn't even throwing any punches you know I got to go back and rewatch Garcia versus uh, Matisse I covered it I remember I had like 40 fucking thousand views this was years and years ago because I was the, I was one of the people that was saying that Danny could beat Lucas Matisse and this was when I was on another another channel though but man like shit used to be lit I used to be a drunken fool Boy, I'm talking about going viral every weekend. Those was the good old days. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, Danny's good. But at 154, you even heard his father say it. Angel Garcia just said at the uh, post-fight press conference. In fact, this is what we're going to do because this is this is relevant. We're going to play the last eight minutes of this post-fight press conference. You know why? Because if you didn't get a chance to see it, there's some relevant information in here. For example, how Danny Garcia only weighed in at 159 pounds coming into the fight to where Jose Benavidez had posted a pic on his social media hours before they got in the ring at him weighing at 172 pounds. So he probably came into the ring at like 175 plus, 
You dig? But anyway, uh, take your time out. Like the video. Subscribe. We're going to be here for the next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so. We got multiple things to talk about. Also, I am so excited for my podcast that's going to be launching. I've never been excited for something in my life. I um, got the jitters, though, a little bit. But nonetheless, let's go listen to this press conference and wrap it up. All right, let's listen to it. And then um, we're going to talk about everything after. So, yeah, since you're here, it'd be great if the 47 of you that are here right now would just drop a like or dislike the video. That's your right. I can see the dislikes. Um, I have this uh, plug in that I use. Discuss your victory that you would open up, you know, in front of everyone about your mental health struggles. And do you see yourself as someone who would be an advocate for those struggling with mental illness? Um, I was going to say it, but I didn't know I was going to break down. Like I just kept crying. I'm like, damn, I'm a little bitch. But but that's what that's what that's what um, breaks people like when you don't talk about it. Because if you, you like being an athlete, people tell you to be strong, don't be weak. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I don't feel good. Train harder, run harder. So people look at you already like you're strong. So you just keep it to yourself. And like 20, 20 something years plus of keeping it to myself, it just kind of like bursted. And I just felt like I was tired mentally. And I just, I knew that I needed a rest from the boxing. I, I knew boxing was triggering it, to be honest. It wasn't nothing else. Because I only felt like that when I was fighting. But now I know how to get around it. I know how to turn the switch off. I know how to talk to somebody. I know how to go for a run or just, just occupy my mind and get past whatever's making me feel that way. Just stay strong until I get past that. Yes, sir. Antonio, AB Boxing News. Angel, um, seeing Danny's great performance tonight, what can you do? All right, this is where their important part uh, stuff comes in. I didn't want to cut off my man mental health uh, 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 speech there uh, but yeah anyway this is the important stuff use towards this fight to take to later down the line another fight he looked great tonight he took shots but Avita never touched the body I mean he's not a skillful fighter but he's a strong fighter like Danny said he couldn't hurt Danny Danny with some good shots but at the end of the day what I seen on Danny was we need to get a little bigger that's it like a little more muscle because Danny got the power but you know, it was his first night, 54, and he looked great to me. And if Danny would have been great when he fought uh, Spence, he would never beat Danny the night we fought Ray Catch, before he started suffering from anxiety and depression. Because that came through the COVID. That, that had a lot to do with it, too. And, you know, not making excuses for the Spence fight, but I should have spoke up, but I didn't. thought he would get over the hump, but he never did. But afterwards, we got over it. So... When Danny fought Ray Cat that night, Spence wanted to beat Danny. Remember, he had the car accident that we took six months to so he recover. So that night, he will never beat Danny. But now we back. Now we're looking at the future. The future is Lara, Thurman, Chalo. If he vacate, we going for one of them buckles. <laughs> we're here to win. We're here to be champions at 154. We should have been with Cotto, but we could have got that fight when Cotto was retiring. And I turned it down because Puerto Rico was in darkness. So I should have did it. Danny would have been been the champion. And then we could have fought um, Peterson. At, at, we fought him at a catchway. We could have been the IBF champion, too. He could have been unified. IBF, WBC, WBA, Ring Magazine champion of the world. You know what I'm saying? So we're looking forward now. We, we passed all that. Now we're looking at a new era in Danny's life, a new chapter. It's at 154, we fight. Whoever won it, they can get it. Like like Broner said, Mexicans can get it, Africans can get it, Puerto Ricans can get it, anybody can get it. <laughs> My daughter wants to see something. <laughs> Hello guys. Um, so, hi. <laughs> So I just wanted to say how I felt when my dad was fighting. So I felt a little nervous, but but I knew he was going to win my salad. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to cut the kid off. Bye-bye. All right, perfect. <laughs> but um, let's see what this next question is. Uh, James Bell here, the boxing source. Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, your relationship with your father. You talk about, you know, dealing with their anxiety, um, like kind of like going to, you know, going. Okay, nope. 
Uh, so here's the thing. How come all of a sudden people see uh, Iris Lindy Laura's food? You know, first Thurman one team at a, at a potential catch weight. Um, this would be above 154 pounds, maybe 155 Canelo weight. Now, all of a sudden, Danny Garcia is calling calling him out. Now, if you don't know, um, for those who haven't been paying attention, here's Lindy Lara's last several fights, several fights, several years. His legs have been kind of gone. So therefore, he's he, he's more vulnerable, if you will. Jerry Swift heard was like 200 pounds. You just weight bullied him, you know, um, Laura held his, she was trying to hold his fucking own, but he just couldn't keep Jared Hurd off of him. Now, Danny Garcia, if you've heard, he came into the ring at about 159 pounds or so. He looked it. He's a small 154 pounder. Now, can you really blame him for wanting a rematch with Keith Thurman? I can't really blame him for that. But would he try to you would he try to say Thurman has to come up to 154? You know, would he go back down to 147 or would we be cool with it? I'll be cool with it in the middle, like 150, something like that. I'd be cool with that. But as far as Charlo, that's the fight that everyone wants. Me personally, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Love Danny Garcia to death. But Jamel Charlo would put a boot in Danny Garcia's ass. In fact, Jamel Charlo, in my personal opinion, beats everybody at 154 pounds. Just my personal opinion. I'm a huge Charlo guy. And there's still bad blood between me and Jamal Charlo. I'm hoping that the next time I see him, I'm going to go to an event sometime soon that maybe, you know, um, you know, we can probably finalize a delicate truce. Uh, the shit's just, it went real bad back in, what was that? The beginning of 2020. So everything's been kind of fucked up since then. But anyway, um, Danny Garcia, Tony Harrison is the fight to make. In fact, Tony Harrison had called out Danny Garcia. Let me see if I can find that clip for you. You know, he was at the fight. And I think for 154, you know, that's the way to go. You know, if he can't get Charlo. Now, let's just go ahead and, you know, talk about it. Charlo was tied up at 154. He's tied up. You know, he's the undisputed champion. Ain't no way Danny Garcia is going to get him unless he's a mandatory. For example, when Charlo returns, he's supposed to be fighting Tim Zhu. That's going to be uh, in like January the 28th or something like that. Then whatever the hell is going on with Brock Ram Mertazali of IBF mandatory. Then you got Sebastian Fandora, who's the WBC mandatory right now, the interim champion. And then you got Israel Madrimov, um, who is the weakest of the champion. No, wait, the weakest of the top guys that he is the WBA world belt. It's the, the bullshit joint. But I think Danny Garcia can probably beat him. I don't think Danny Garcia can beat Tony Harrison. Danny Garcia may be able to outwill Erickson Lubin. He could probably I'm gonna say Danny can beat him. I'm not confident Danny Garcia can beat Sebastian Vendora. Sebastian Vendora is just gonna to be too big in that ring. You know, but I think I think Tony Harrison is the way to go. But if you're Danny Garcia coming off of a pay-per-view, I mean, coming off of being pay-per-view, having a resume that he has, you know, it's understandable that he wants, you know, to try to go after some big fight. And if he was to fight Laura and beat him, there is going to be some 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 <clears throat> some some some. Like he'll be able to say he beat Iris Lady Laura. Like, I like that. There's going to be some appeal to that. You know, I would want to see Danny Garcia versus Iris Lady Laura. I would want to see Keith Thurman versus Iris Lady Laura. But I don't think that Iris Lady Laura is the, the food that Danny Garcia and Keith Thurman, especially Jelly Belly Keith Thurman. But then again, Laura don't really go to the body. But overall boxing, I think that Iris Lady Laura would still beat Danny Garcia today because that's, it was, that's Danny Garcia's issue. He's always had issues with boxers, fighters that can outbox him. Let's go look at some of the guys at 154 pounds. Do a little process of elimination here. You got Tony Harrison. He's number one. If Tony Harrison and Danny Garcia, it would be likely a final eliminator for the WBC. But Sebastian Fandori is the interim champion. If he fights Bakram Mertazaliev, Maybe he can jump the line and become the IBF mandatory, try to get Charlo that way after Tim Zoo. You know, they can maybe do Charlo versus Danny Garcia on pay-per-view. You know, they'll try that shit. Tim Zoo is the WBO. As I said, him and uh, Charlo was supposed to be fighting um, 
basically, you know, the end of January 2020, 2023, likely because PBC don't have the dates available. Who can Danny Garcia beat at 154? Him and Liam Smith would be a fun fight, but Liam Smith is also a big 154 pounder. Like he can compete at 168. You know, but now I'm not now politically, I don't think it can happen. You know, but I but we're just looking at guys that Danny could possibly beat. He can beat Liam Smith. I'm gonna go ahead and say that. Charles Conwell, I'm not gonna he that ain't gonna happen. Charles Conwell also got a, you know, who is he with? He's with the Bella and who else? Um, Teal's manager, right? Maybe Danny Garcia, Carlos Ocampo, but Carlos Ocampo been looking good. Remember, former Errol Spence mandatory. But at 154, he's been looking really, really good. And yeah, Erickson Lubin's not going to be an easy night for Danny Garcia. So Danny, and remember, Danny Garcia and his team know this. You know, they know the same thing we're doing. I'm sure him, his father, and, you know, their team probably already looked at these fighters to be like, you know what, Erickson Lubin, yeah, we could probably be him, but it wouldn't be no walk in the park. Liam Smith, that would probably be a nice win under our belt. We could probably win that fight, likely would, but politically, you know, he's over in the U.K., you know, fighting between a Sky Sports boxer and the zone, um, Eddie Hearn, before Jesse Vargas put a boot in his ass. You know, Tim Zhu, they already know Tim Zhu is right now getting the Charlo fight. You know, and, you know, it's it's going to be about a fight that also they can make. Danny Garcia versus Sergio Garcia. Sergio Garcia was talking about retirement, but that's a step back from, in my opinion, fighting Sergio Garcia. I don't think that's going to work. I think that's going to be a step back. You know, for Danny Garcia and Showtime, you know, if you notice, Showtime usually does a progression with their fighters. So if he fought um, Jose Benavidez, that was like the stepping stone to see or the, the, the tester to see how he would look in the division. So I would expect likely that Danny Garcia's next fight is going to be somebody on a higher level than a uh, Jose Benavidez. You know, I don't think Sergio Garcia, I don't think it's going to be him. It's going to be, uh, uh, it's, and, and also, Danny Garcia commands a lot of money. So they can't just put him in, in, in there against anyone, especially when the ratings of Danny Garcia, which just came out via boxing scene, uh, peaked at about 450000 You know, now, understand a lot of people in this, day, in this day and age, you know, they watch through um, the apps, like, for example, Showtime Anytime. I'm not really a fan of Showtime Anytime because you can't uh, rewind. But that those readings go off of uh, Nielsen and basically who's watching through their dish or cable or, you know, satellite provider. But I would expect that, you know, a lot more people in this day and age are watching through sh or through um, streams like, you know, like like the Showtime app. Um, who else? Brian Castaño, that would be a great fight. I would entertain that. But you know how fighters like to do, you know, it's rare that you see fighters, um, especially PBC fighters or really in any promotional company, but definitely with PBC fighters. You don't see them go from fighting one big fight and then go directly into another one unless you're fucking like a B side like Mario Barrios or something like that. You know, it's rare. And I was even surprised to see that happen. You know, so I, it's hard for me to see. Uh, uh, Brian Castaño will be a next for Danny Garcia or at least without Brian Castaño getting a win under his belt first before they start building that up. But if I was to pick somebody for Danny Garcia, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it's... And I'm talking about fights that can be made, like politically. Carlos Adamas. Wait, he's at 160 now, right? Yeah, but... He's still holding on to this ranking at 154 for a reason. He's got to notify the IBF, so he's there for a reason. Fucking Austin Trout's still kicking about out there. Still flapping about. Ill. It's no disrespect to Austin, no doubt Trout, but like, bro, it's fucking 2022. Damn it, 2023. And he's ranked number five by the IBF. What has he been doing? He just fought in Germany like a few weeks ago. What are you, 36 years old? They ain't even old in boxing. 35-5-1 with 18K. Why am I entertaining this? Y'all, would you, would you accept Danny Garcia versus Austin Trout? Or is that degenerate, low-down, boxing, scumbag shit? What am I doing? I don't want to see that. 
I will enter. Nah, what am I doing? Let me no, no, no. Let me get away from there. <clears throat> but my bet, my bet is this Bakram Murtazaliev guy has been being screwed big time by the IBF, like big time. He's been fighting on Charlo dark matches, undercards, not even televised for him to be an eventual opponent for Charlo. But I knew he was never going to get Charlo because they wasn't even putting him on the undercard. They were putting him on like untelevised dark matches and shit. So what if they do Danny Garcia and they throw a whole bunch of money at Murtazaliev to try to buy that mandatory spot for Danny Garcia. You, you kind of follow me where I'm going? PBC would do that shit, though. They would do it. That's why they would do Danny Garcia versus Austin Trout. They Listen, they will pull out some shit. Like, for example, when they pulled out um, just something off the top of my head, like where the fuck they pull that from type of fight. Your Dennis Ugas versus Mike Dallas Jr. I mean, Mike Dallas. Like they and that was just a couple of fights ago for him. Like they'll do some shit like that. Like how they did Iris Lady Lara versus uh Yuri Foreman. Like they will pull oh, they just did Lara versus Michael Sullivan. So they will pull some shit. They will pull some bullshit out. So don't don't be surprised if we see Danny Garcia versus Austin Trout. Don't be surprised, bro. You know, but ill. Let's not let's not talk that into the air. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see Danny Garcia versus Murtazaliev and the winner will be the mandatory for Jamel Charlo. I won't be surprised because they'll be the next mandatory after Tim Zhu. So which means, let's say, for example, we see Danny Garcia versus Murtazaliev maybe this December or maybe sometime in January or a couple of weeks before or after uh, Jamel Charlo versus Tim Zhu. And then sometime in the summer, maybe around this time next year, we can see Danny Garcia versus Charlo. You know? But for some reason, I don't know if Danny Garcia wants, wants any pieces of Tony Harrison because, you know, they've been kind of throwing it out there and even Showtime is pushing it. Let me see if I can uh, find the interview for you. Showtime is pushing it because they gave him an interview, meaning Tony Harrison, on the broadcast. They probably told him to show up. Let me see if I can find the uh, the uh, interview for you. I'm going to have to uh, look it up on uh, Twitter. But yeah, uh, thanks for watching. Take your time out. Like the video. Subscribe. My chat fucked up. Oh, no, my chat's working today. That's what's up. Uh, in the meantime, while I'm looking up this clip, I need some brown rice recipes. I'm on my weight loss journey. I um, got some some more snack. The uh, lime green, uh, the lime. I think it's lime green apple uh, powder shit was two scoops and 12 ounces of water. So I was pretty I, I was pretty jacked earlier, like like energetic, like running around. Did uh, three miles on the treadmill. And let me tell you something. My shins are killing me. I think I need like some. Uh better uh support in my shoes i did stretching and yoga and all that shit yes t street does dabble in some downward dog i ain't too hood to do some yoga there we are here we are let's listen to this what tony harrison's had to say during the uh broadcast i'm here with the former light middleweight champion tony harrison tony you would like to fight perhaps Donny, uh, Danny Garcia next. What's your assessment of how he's doing so far? Uh, I mean, I, th I think he's doing good, but it's right, right, right now we're seeing two 147-pounders come up to my division and fight each other. Um, right now, Danny Garcia got his feet in the, in, in, in the pool, on the edge of the pool. I, I need him to come to Three miles. The I mean, hopefully, man, I'm only here to, give, to bring him in the deep end and show him what Detroit guys do. And why do you think that you should be the next opponent? I mean, he can. Well, I mean, who? I mean, if 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 we talking about somebody that 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 bring gen, that that generate money to the sport, it's Danny Garcia. But who who you gonna jump in front of? Who we gonna fight? Come on, spit it out. Best best next thing is it gotta be him. And what do you look for to happen here as the fight moves on and hit to the uh, later rounds? I pray to God, Danny, win. I love Danny. I pray to God he win, and I pray to God we dance next. I'm here with the. So yeah, you know, Showtime gave him the time, and he's right. There's two 147 pounders up in there. 
You know, so to go back to what I was saying earlier in the video before we started, you know, Danny looked good. You know, he looked good. But at the end of the day, he fought a guy with a plate in his leg, you know, with one leg that does no movement. So the body was easy to hit. How did Danny Garcia win the fight? Body punching. Clean, accurate punching from a stationary target. It's no disrespect to Danny. He looked good. But he was in there against someone who really wasn't in there fighting. I was really disappointed in Jose Benavidez because I used to be really, really high on him. And to see just the way he fought in there, it was like, damn, bro. Like, are you really, like, washed up? Do you not give a fuck? Are you here for the check? Or is it like when you one of them fighters, like, where your leg, like, is done? Like, you're done. So, as I said, you know, I would want to see Danny Garcia versus Tony Harrison next. But I wouldn't be surprised if he tries to go after that IBF spot. And if not Tony Harrison, then fuck it. I'll entertain him versus Iris Lane Laura and watch Danny Garcia get outboxed. I like Danny Garcia. But at the end of the day, I think Laura would still outbox him. And it will likely be for Laura's belt at 160 pounds, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Maybe at a catch rate of 155. Or they're going to get him to come down back down to 154. I mean, does Laura still have that WBA world belt? Like, what's going on with that? You know? And I didn't like all that taunting that uh, Jose Benavidez was doing. And what 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 was up with that drunk judge? Like, that judge was a drunk. Well, that's that judge's name. Let's listen to this crap. Ringside, Walesco Roldan scores about 114. That drunk, drunk, drunkard judge. decision, here are the score totals. Judge of Brings High, Walesco Roldan scores about 114 to 114, even a draw. Overruled by judges Glenn Feldman, who scores about 116 to 112. And Anthony Pelino scoring the action 117 to 111 in favor of the winner, Danny Swift. Victorious drunk ass judge. Let's go look at that judge's card. See what he was thinking. Was the, oh that was a female, right? What were you thinking? Let me look at these rounds here. Let's go full screen. See if we can get a little. What was you thinking? Let me go see. So this judge. This judge gave rounds one, two, four. Eight, nine. And eleven. This judge was drunk. Like how? Let me see if I can look up this judge to see if she got the Nancy Pelosi face. You know how like certain people you can look at and just be like, yo, you can tell you a heavy ass drinker. You know that look like what's that comedian name? The white dude uh, uh, always got always sweating. Got the got the liquor glass. I forgot his name. Let me see if it's one of those judges. What you look like? Waleska. Is this you? Oh. Oh, no, she don't look like a drunkard. She looked cool. You think she was probably on the sauce that night, though? It's a lot of bars around the Barclays Center. T-Street knows. You think she crooked? She's on the take, but it's all Al Heyman event. Who paid her? You think maybe Team Benavidez? No, let me shut up. I don't want to get canceled. Let me shut up. Anyway... Um, I guess we're going to move on to the next topic here, which is a fight that I really didn't really give a fuck about, to be honest. I mean, I did expect for Jake Paul to lose if they did fight in the ring. And if you want me to say it straight from the beginning, I feel I feel that Jake Paul and his team wanted a way out. And remember, he already said Jake Paul already said that his team didn't want him to take the fight. Even the athletic commission didn't want him to take the fight. And with this whole, you know, weight thing, I understand that 
I seen Rockman sign the contract. You signed the contract. That's why I never got involved in all that catch weight, Manny Pacquiao shit. You know how they were saying he was catch weighting everybody? And oh, if he would have fought Cotto at the real weight and all that. I never got into that because at the end of the day, these are grown ass men. They signed the contract. You signed the contract. You know, so the 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 issue with Hussein Rahman is the commission, New York State Athletic Commission, saw that he was struggling to cut weight bad. And he and you know, he does have a reputation that's been floating around out there that he doesn't do his best in training. So he wasn't really, really, I mean, you know, he's a heavyweight. And from when looking at his box rec, the lowest he's been in his career was about 212 pounds or so. And you're asking a guy who never went to 200 pounds to be at 200 pounds for a fight that was what on five weeks notice or something like that. Now, Jake Paul and his team knew what they were doing. You know, they're the A-side. So if they're fighting finally their first natural boxer, then they want to make sure he has no extra advantages at all. But let's go listen to some of the stuff that came out over the weekend. Here's what uh, Jake Paul had to say for those who didn't get a chance to listen. Alrighty, folks, emergency press conference. You may have seen the news. Hasim Rockman Jr. has pulled out of the fight. This is not a joke. I am devastated. I cannot fucking believe this. We just found out this news. And this is just another case of a professional boxer, just like Tommy Fury, being scared to fight me. It's as clear as day that these guys have been so unprofessional to work with, looking for any excuse to suck more money out of this event, to, to coerce us into doing things. And from the jump, I knew in the bottom of my heart that this guy didn't want to get into the ring with me. It's as clear as day. Here's what happened, long story short. So he signed a contract to fight me at 200 pounds and was gonna cut the weight down to 200 pounds. This is not a big cut for him, right? He's a big guy with a ton of weight to lose. So he sent a video into the commission the first time he weighed in at 216 pounds. The commission wanted to track his weight cut to make sure he was doing it in a healthy way. Three weeks later, the commission asked him for an update on his weight. He sends a video weighing 215 pounds, meaning in three weeks, he only lost one pound. So the commission was like, hey man, you're not cutting the weight properly. We don't want you to lose it all in the last day. We're gonna have to change this fight to 205 pounds. My team calls me up, they're like, hey man, do you wanna change, they wanna change the weight to 205 pounds, that's a big difference. You normally fight at 190 pounds. Do you wanna do the fight still? I said, no problem, let's do it. 205 pounds, he's gonna have, he already has a weight advantage, height advantage, reach advantage, all of these things, but whatever. I know I can still beat his ass at 205 pounds. And, that was that. We move forward. And then today, out of nowhere, his team calls and says, Hasim's not going lower than 215 pounds. If the fight's not at 215 pounds, then we're pulling out. My manager goes, fuck you guys. You're not in control of this. We already agreed to five more pounds. He is a big guy, losing 10 pounds. Everyone knows in the sport of boxing that is an easy weight cut. People do that. UFC champions cut 25 pounds overnight to make weight. A 10 pound weight cut for a heavyweight is nothing. This is clearly an excuse. So they say, okay, the fight's not at 215, we're out. The biggest payday of his life, time. There it is, a part two. Let him finish up, but then we're going to listen to uh, Hasim's take. We're out. Starts to say, okay, the fight's not at 215, we're out. The biggest payday of his life, times 10 and he's fumbling it. For what? Because he knows he's gonna get knocked out by me. The pressure starts to set in and it's exactly what happens with all of these guys. Same shit with Tommy Fury. I'm sick of it, I'm devastated. I apologize to everyone on the undercard. Amanda Serrano, I know you were working hard. Ashton Silva, I know you were working hard. This is absurd. There's nothing I can do about it. I apologize to the fans and uh, I'll be back at some point. Now here's my thoughts. Um, Jake Paul has a lot of fans, okay? And um, he's also amassed a nice hardcore boxing um, following. You know, you got a hardcore boxing fans who really ride, ride with him. But understand that he's a salesman and he knows what he's doing when he's doing all this stuff. It's, it's, you know, it's by design. So with his large fan base, he is trying to control the narrative. But in the world today, I am entitled to my opinion. 
And if you don't like it, that's fine. Remember, we are not always supposed to agree. We're not always going to agree. There's going to be, and I say this all the time, there's going to be sometimes you're going to be like, yo, man, this T-Street guy knows what he's talking about. He cool. There's going to be other times you're going to be like, this guy's a fucking dickhead. Like, you know, no wonder why he's this and that. You know, I get it all the time. The point is, I don't think that the tickets were doing well. I don't think that the pay-per-view was trending well. And then there was the possibility of him getting knocked out. And it's not like um, his pay-per-views haven't been dipping with each fight. Pay-per-view numbers. You know, he's somewhat still, even though he wants to take it seriously, I commend Jake Paul for that. He wants to be seriously, take this serious, serious. And if you also don't know, the WBC was about to give him a ranking at Cruiserweight. But I think that Hussein Rahman gave them the reason that they needed to be like, you know what? Listen, we're pulling out this shit. Hussein Rahman, though, he's losing his big payday. And he's probably going to fade off into obscurity. Um, I'm not sure if we'll see him and Jake Paul fight, you know, because Jake Paul can, you know, for example, there's that talk of after Nate Diaz's fight. Um, what is that two UFC 279 or 280? Well, anyway, he's pretty much getting fed to the wolves. And after that fight, it's a good chance that we can see Jake Paul versus Nate Diaz. Even Showtime is already kind of, you know, talking about it. So my personal opinion is I really don't think that, you know, put they, they had every right to stop the fight and, you know, to be like, you know what? Y'all don't control anything. Who are you, you know, to think you're going to be calling the shots here? Let's go listen to a little bit of it. Wait a minute, I'm pretty sure I pulled it up. This was from the Zoom call. This is the manager. They lowballed him so crazy, so crazy when they offered Tommy Fury two million dollars and they offer my man 250 that's like spinning his fucking face and then you want him to come down to 200 pounds but you did sign the contract i mean there's contracts are out there you sign it that's what you do uh but then you are going to go back on some of the stipulations that were in the contract I didn't go, this is the thing i didn't go back on it i wasn't the one that, that asked for the weight checks i didn't ask for the weight checks i never agreed to do no weight checks Mm -hmm. I never uh, uh, agreed to have my weight monitored for all the entirety of the camp. I didn't know that was what was going to happen. But was um, that in the contract? I mean, it's not something no, as your team wasn't. should look over. I mean, your that contracts are contracts. I mean, what, what do you want me to do? Even though it's not in the contract, what do you want me to do not hop on the scale and cancel the fight three, four weeks out? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. They lowballed him so crazy. They come from very different backgrounds. Obviously, you've got the boxing pedigree. A couple years ago, this guy is a YouTuber. We, we know the backstories. Any regret? Any regret in your mind even, you know, getting in and wanting to do business with Jake Paul? Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the, the, the only thing, the only thing um, I could really say is I had, a, I had a, a tremendous amount of respect for what he, what he was doing um, and what he's done. until I got on the inside and now I see how you know how many strings can be my bad that was me my bad Ford and all this different type of stuff that he tries to do to give himself an advantage and him not really giving a fair shake um also with his comments about um trying to pretty much blackball me from boxing telling people not to do any fights with me I'm a young black fight well I'm not that young no more. I'm 31 years old, but uh, I'm, I'm a black fighter in America. And, um, you know, I, I don't know how he feed his. I'm not no YouTuber, but th this is my this is what my family eats off of. This is what I've been uh, what our family has been eating off of for decades now. So um, for him to do that, I lost a tremendous amount of respect for him. And um, I, now uh, it will be my it will be my goal for him not to see the final bell. It would be a personal goal for him not to see the final belt if we ever get in there. Throughout this whole promotion, um, I said I could knock him out. I could knock him out. I may, I may knock him out, maybe a knockout. I don't really know what's going to happen. Um, but now, given his new antics, if he ever gets in the ring with me, he's not going to see the final belt. 
And one more from me. What what would you say to Jake? If Jake was going to watch this, what's your message to Jake Paul? Uh, Jake's a... <laughs> Uh, just stop being scared, Jake. We got a lot of people out there watching us. We got a lot of people out there to look up to you. A lot of people out there to look up to me. Stop being scared. Be a man. Put the gloves on. Um, you know, it, 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 stop being scared. It's, it's that simple. You get in a fight with a real fighter, man. Get in there, uh, get your ass whooped, and then go ahead back to YouTube. I don't know. Um, you know, my opinion still stands. He signed the contract for the weight. Even though I feel that Jake Paul wanted out, you know, or not him, but his team, you know, because it was, you know, high risk, low reward, you know, and then, you know, there was a lot of money involved, you know, in Jake Paul's future. You know, they couldn't have him losing to this dude, especially when this dude's going to weigh what he wants to weigh. You can't, you know, you can't argue that. That can't be argued. But I'm wondering now if they were to fight, you know, and it gets rescheduled. You know, it will it will it contribute to some better sales? Like, do you want to? Here's the question: Do you want to see it more now? You know, like, okay, you know what? Now I kind of have some interest in this. <clears throat> I mean, I do. I still want to see it. You know, in fact, I would rather see him over Tommy Fury. Tommy Fury was only there because of the name. You know, and Tommy Fury, he's not. You know, like in my opinion, he's not good. But I do feel that once Jake Paul runs into a boxer like a Seam Rockman or even a Tommy Fury, for example, Tommy Fury is dreadful to me, but I still would support and think that Tommy Fury will beat um, Jake Paul because he is from a boxing family. He's a boxer, even though he's part celebrity, too, over there. You know, Love Island and all that shit. He is a boxer. And my opinion is that the fight wasn't doing well this time around. And Haseem Rockman. And his team gave him reason, you know, to, gave them reason to be like, you know what? Here we are bending over ass backwards for you. You know, meaning Jake Paul team to a scene, Rockman, and you can't make weight, you know, and you're not even really showing that you're trying to make weight. But, you know, I was still supported, though. Let me see if I can pull up this. Uh, let me see if I can pull up something else here. Here, check this out from BJ Flores, who's also in the camp of uh, Jake Paul. Here's what he posted. It was 30 pounds. Why make him lose all that weight? Just stop. The video was sent to us on July 7th by Team Rockman as proof he can make the weight in 30 days. 16 pounds in over 30 days is very possible. 25 days later, Team Rockman refuses to come in below 215. Stop with the excuses. Let's look at this clip. Oh, let me turn that down. So it's showing him weighing in. Y'all think he was frightened with the weight? I'm like doing some bullshit. say 217 this was on july the 7th i mean here's the thing going into the fight though we were hearing about that um haseem rahman had some issues with being called a lazy fighter what up leonardo compass vasquez um i want chavez jr versus jake paul oh i would love that i would love chavez jr versus jake paul but chavez jr is going through some shit right now you know I don't, you know, I don't even think he can box, but I would love it. I even sent Chavez Jr. a DM on Instagram. No bullshit about the fight. He didn't respond. One night years and years ago, he responded. I forgot what I asked him. And sometimes he will respond to fans. And I asked him something and he responded in some, some more weird shit. But I don't know, man. I'm not, you know, and also um, about Serafina. Um, one of his co-promoters or co-manager, whoever she is. Listen, I'm not trying to hear shit about 
you know, him being lowballed and they offered Tommy Fury a million dollars. They only offered um, the same Rockman Jr. two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's a big difference. Tommy Fury has some profile. The same Rockman, just because he's the same Rockman's son doesn't mean he had a profile over here. And also you signed the contract. Don't start bitching now about the money. Like, I'm not trying to hear none of that shit. Fans are not trying to hear none of that shit. But at the end of the day, you know, enough about that. The fight has been postponed. And, uh, you know, I'm not really confident that it can be revisited. Because what? It's still going to have to be at 200 pounds. You know, and here, let's go look at um, Hassim Rahman's uh, box rec before we, um, before we go and talk about um, the return of Virgil Ortiz Jr., he had a Zoom card earlier today. But look, here is uh, Masim Rahman's uh, box wreck. His last fight, this last April, he was 224. Last year, a year ago, he was uh, 215, 224. It says here, he said he never waited in no 269. But box wreck has it here at 269. 231. The lowest he's been was um, basically 212, 211 and a quarter, 211 three quarters. So naturally, if you were to round this off, he's about a 220 pound fighter, 225 pound fighter. So trying to get down to 200 pounds would have probably severely handicapped him, handicapped him. But also, you know, he don't probably have the money to pay for someone to help him lose the weight properly. He's a heavyweight. Heavyweights don't be worrying about or, or don't worry about cutting weight or maybe not know how to cut weight like, you know, um, um, fighters in lower divisions who have to live their whole life around cutting weight. And Jake Paul is the last person to be speaking on that because he's not a boxer and he fights at his walk around weight. You know, so for him to talk about how UFC fighters do it. And let me tell you something, them UFC fighters, they be damn near getting ready to kill themselves. Go look at when Cyborg was over there, when they literally like went through how she cut weight. That cutting weight shit ain't easy, especially when you're a guy. And the, and the New York State Athletic Commission, they probably seen, you know, that like, wait a minute, this is a heavyweight. Whatever he's doing, he ain't doing it right. So let's make sure he's not going to do no dumb shit and try to cut weight and damn near kill himself trying to get on the scale. You see what I'm saying? Anyway. Uh, take your time out, like the video, subscribe. Let's go talk about uh, main man Virgil Ortiz, who's back this weekend. Do y'all care? You know, th is it me? Or did Virgil Ortiz, well, he's still only 24. But what are they doing with him? He's currently ranked number one by the WBC, WBA, and WBO. Doesn't mean he's mandatory. But when are they going to order something? You know what my gut is telling me? My gut is telling me all these sanctioning bodies, even the IBF, as you can see here, look, Boots number one, Virgil number three. All these sanctioning bodies are scared to order this fight because they know it's probably not going to get made. But why, though? Why can't we have like the big domestic clashes like they do over in the UK where guys, you know, usually they have to fight for that British title you know, to be able to go on to like the world stage. We've seen it happen with guys like Billy Joe Saunders, Chris Eubank Jr. Um, he just fought again this weekend. But um, uh, even this weekend too, CBS, Chris Billum Smith versus Isaac Chamberlain, um, Lawrence O'Kali versus Isaac Chamberlain as well. Who else? You know, like they have tons of fights. Just off the top of my head, I can't think of them, even though I've covered a lot of them. But they have tons of fights where, you know, the top guys in the country fight each other before they go on to a world title. But in this case, I don't see anyone having the balls between any of these sanctioning bodies to order Virgil Ortiz versus Boots Ennis because likely it won't happen. And Virgil Ortiz had a media call earlier today. Um, I recorded it. It's, I'm going to be releasing it on the channel sometime later on this evening or probably tomorrow. But Colin Wood, but... He's taught, he says basically he's going to be staying at 147 pounds. You know that he wants to be at 147 pounds. He doesn't want to get a belt and move up to 154 because let's face it, whoever wins the two, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's probably going to be two, the two Spence versus Crawford fights, both of them fighters are probably going to move up to 154 pounds. 
You know, Spence has been talking about it. Crawford's been talking about it. But Spence, in my opinion, can easily go on, go up to 160 pounds. Maybe even compete at 168 one day before it closes out his career. But I see definitely 160 in his future. So the so Boots and Virgil Ortiz, if you look at it, those are the guys. And Connor Ben. Those it. Those are that's the future of the 147 pound division. So are those two guys going to become the next Spence Crawford where they're not going to fight in their prime? They're going to be dancing around each other and shit. I don't have no, I don't have no faith that they're going to fight at 147 pounds, but definitely not at no. I mean, maybe at 154, but that's the politics of boxing. And of course, you see Keith Thurman. He don't want to. He don't want no parts up. Keith Thurman ain't going to fight no boots in his. You know, he knows what time it is. You know, Keith Thurman used to be in that spot where he used to want guys like Paulie Malignaggi and Robert Guerrero, you know, and they used to try to avoid him like the plague, Robert Guerrero. But that was a different circumstance. That was the, the, the premiere of premier boxing champions that was on ABC, right? There was so much money thrown at him that he had to take the fight. I don't think that's going to happen with Keith Thurman versus Boots Ennis. Connor Ben, his affiliation with Matchroom is not going to get him the same. Basically, he's going to have the same problems Terrence Crawford had um, being with top rank. He's not going to be able to get the fights. And Virgil Ortiz, what are they going to do? Try to fight, you know, for I me mean, right now. I feel whoever wins between Spence and Crawford, those two fights that Virgil Ortiz will end up fighting for a vacant belt. And then we'll have maybe Virgil Ortiz and Boots Ennis, you know, maybe collecting belts. But let's face it, both of these guys aren't the most charismatic of dudes. They're no different than Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford trying to get, you know, all this mega money for a fight that may not even do do 500,000 pay-per-view buys. These guys just and, and, and listen, is it a crime? Let's talk about the real shit. Errol Spence, Terrence Crawford, Boots Ennis and Virgil Ortiz, they don't have that crossover appeal they don't at least not now and if Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford don't have it now they ain't never going to get it yeah they can sell some pay-per-views especially Spence but they're not guys that like transcend the sport you see what I'm saying they don't and all these guys and all these managers and all these promoters want to try to make these guys into the next Floyd Mayweather and look it ain't happening they don't have it Yeah, Boots got the swag. Virgil Ortiz has got the Mexican following. They both have something. These fighters all have something that they that they bring into the table. Oh, I can't wait to do a video on the zone. They make me sick. I'm just waiting for them to announce uh uh Usyk versus Joshua on pay-per-view. I can't do my zone subscription. I'm going to be back this weekend, though, but I canceled it for like two weeks just to let them know I'm in charge. You get my $21 when I when I want you to have it. Shit. But yeah, I am upset with the zone. They're on my shit list. But by the way, yes, Virgil Ortiz returns. He is going to be taking on uh, Michael McKinson. Um, Virgil Ortiz, 18 and 0. With 18 KOs. Last fight against Iglesias Cavalaskis, Maurice Hooker, Samuel Vargas, Brad Solomon, Antonio Rosco, Mauricio Herrera. Nice, solid 154-pound, I mean, 147-pound resume. You know, um, McKinson, ain't nobody really asked for that. This is just a reschedule. McKinson was talking big shit, though, because he only has two KOs. He was, it was a media call earlier today. I was on it early this morning. I'm going to upload it later on for those who want to hear it. But he was talking big shit about how, like, he beat, you know, undefeated fighters before, which he has. Nobody on the level of, um, of um, Virgil Ortiz. But basically, he's confident. You know, I'm not giving him too much of a chance, you know, but he's confident and he's undefeated. So, you know, undefeated fighters are, you know, going to be confident. But only those two KUs, that's a little alarming, bro, going against a guy who's 18 and 0 with 18 KUs, 24 years old, you know? So, I mean, more power to the to the Brit, the Englishman, but something's telling me he gonna get, you know, he gonna he gonna get he gonna get it real ugly. It's gonna be real nasty. Um on the undercard, I'm looking forward to this one. Hashtag hooker cops. You're going to have Maurice Hooker returning 27-2-3 with 18 KOs. Last fight against Virgil Ortiz got stopped. He's going to be taking on, guess who? The Cringe returns. He's got a crazy story, too, from Philly. 
the cringe player cops. Now, let me tell you something. I it's rare where I do a prediction on a fight where it's like, yo, dude's going to get beat the fuck up. That's how I was when he fought uh, Alexis Rocha. I was like, yo, it's going to be ugly. And man, oh, man, we're going to be talking about this fight a whole lot this week. So trust me, I'm going to be talking about a lot of Blair Cobbs, but man, oh man, did he get knocked the fuck out. But now he's back. This is a nice fight. I like this fight. I like this fight. Also, you have Marlon Esparza versus Eva Guzman. One thing about Golden Boy, though, they do keep their fighters active when they can. You know, Virgil Ortiz was injured and then it was COVID. But for the most part, if a guy loses or one of their fighters loses, they, they try to get him back out there. But overall, remember, Alex Martin was the guy who um, had fought McKinson as a late replacement for Virgil Ortiz. And look, another Philadelphia gym on the card. My man, hammering Hank Lundy. You know, he's going to have all kind of shit to talk. So as you can see, the smile on my face. I am digging this card. Virgil Ortiz versus Michael McKinson. Maurice Hooker versus Blair Cobbs. Hashtag Hooker Cobbs. Um, Marlon, Marlon Esparza versus Evil Guzman. Have I seen her fight before? Likely, unlikely. Alex Martin versus Hank Lundy. And you were supposed to have uh, Sinesa Super Bad Estrada on the card, but um, she is now a top ring fighter. Good for her. Top ring's going to do some real good things for her, especially since she's got that fan-friendly uh, knockout style. I'm really happy for her. I didn't get a chance to do a video, but shout out to her. I never seen this Eva Guzman woman fight before. Nope. But Marlon Esparza is always in exciting fights. Like always. You know, Olympian as well. So one thing for sure is like it's going, you know, some shit's going to go down. Only lost to Super Bad Estrada. A rematch that I wish they did again. Hopefully it can happen one day in the future again. Hopefully. They were building it up, but a little bit, a little bit too slow. Nah, Hammer and Hank back out there, bro. Hammer and Hank is out there getting it in. Can't wait to see it. I'm hyped. But anyway, guys, uh, take your time out. Uh, like the video. Um, I'm going to be shooting my first podcast episodes this week. I know I said it last week, but I was like, all right, you know what? I'm really waiting for them to announce if Usyk versus Joshua is going to be on the zone pay-per-view. I already have my first four shows um, laid out and I have pretty much like basically my podcast is going to be independent from my YouTube content. It's going to be on all your um, platforms, Audible, Amazon, um, Spotify, iTunes, you know, Apple Store, all that shit. But it's going to be a scripted boxing show where it's going to be, you know, high quality. I'm really, really putting like everything into it. You know, I don't know which day I'm going to be premiering it, but it's looking like I'm guessing Mondays, you know, is going to be is going to have to be the day because who wants to wait until Tuesday to hear the results of the weekend and, you know, like news. So basically, I'm going to be um, doing one episode a week to start and then we're going to start bumping that up with interviews and everything. So listen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up out of here. I got to go run to the market and get some brown rice. I'm doing a new um, I made these beautiful. Oh, man, delicious air fried pork chops, uh, thick cut pork chops. Let me tell you something. I never did something. So I like, you know, to make sure they were done all the way. I cut a little bit off um, at the tip. And then I was like, man, delicious. So I'm making some uh, cilantro uh, brown rice. I'm on my weight loss journey. No, I'm going to be I'm going to be on YouTube, too. Um, I'm going to upload the uh, the podcast on YouTube as well, but likely not until probably a couple of days after it's um, on iTunes or in podcast format. But, yeah, I'm going to uh, make some cilantro, uh, brown rice and probably some asparagus and then take my ass to bed. But all right, guys, um, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here back on Thursday. Wait, let's go look at the boxing schedule first. Hold on. Let me make sure I got my schedule right. Hold on. Tell you what fights I'm covering this week. Okay, so I'm going to be here Saturday for this. The Virgil Ortiz card. We just talked about that. I'm going to be back for the final press conference for that on Thursday. I'm not sure exactly what time. 
likely it's probably going to be probably around like 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. or so, maybe 3 p.m. Eastern. I'm not really interested in this, uh, the zone card with Dalton Smith. I am interested in the rematch between uh, Erica uh, Farias and Sandy Ryan, though. And, you know, you always got to watch Campbell Hatton because you never know when he's going to lose. It can happen any fight now. I am interested in Mick Conlon versus Miguel Mariaga. My man Tyrone McKenna versus Chris Jenkins. So I'm going to be covering three cards on Saturday. I'm covering this uh, Mick Conlon card on ESPN Plus in Northern Ireland. That's a midday card. Um, I am going to be covering this the zone card. Fuck it. That's also a midday card. So both of these cards are going to be competing. One on the zone and one on ESPN Plus. And then, of course, at night, we're going to be streaming during the main event of Virgil Ortiz versus Michael McKinson. And I will be doing a post fight video. So, all right, yeah, it's going to be busy. So, all right, um, take your time out, like the video, subscribe. I'm T Street Controversy with Fight View 360 here. I'm going to put the link to my uh, Twitter for those who want to give me a follow and also links to the WBC app powered by the Vive Network are down below in the description box. Thanks for watching. Uh, see you guys on Thursday. I may be doing some content tomorrow. I'm not sure, but I got to look at the schedule because I do keep